which brings us to this next word here, which may throw you off. It says, the firstborn over all creation. Like, well, wait, wait a minute, Pastor Troy. I thought you said Jesus was eternal. Now you're calling him the firstborn. Firstborn in Greek and Roman culture is a little bit different than today. When I say my firstborn child, we think of Garrett. Little dirty blonde haired kid runs around at rapid speeds and never stops talking. Right? I have another son, Matthew. Screams for no reason. Sometimes you say hi to him and he scowls at you. He's really sweet at home, but he just doesn't always, takes about an hour to warm up to you. So by the time you leave, he's in a good mood. It's, this is how it works. And you would say, well, your firstborn son is Garrett. And your second son is Matthew. That's how we think in our society usually. But the firstborn is more than just a birth order here. What it's saying is who has the preeminent spot. In these kind of societies back then, you would have an heir. And you would designate as someone as your heir, the firstborn. And there are different titles. And what we'll see, this is a position of privilege. First of all, a pri per position of privilege, which Jesus Christ always has. He is preeminent. Many times in the Bible we see that it's not always the person who is born first who is the preeminent heir. We see that in the Bible. You see that there are Jacob and Esau. Esau is born first. Who gets the birthright and the spiritual blessing and the leadership of the home? It's Jacob. You see, among his sons, he has 12 sons. And the one that he had designated originally, you can see this through the presence he bestowed, as the one he was thinking would be his heir, was likely Joseph. But God said, no, it's going to be Judah. And incidentally, those are children numbers, or at least sons numbered 4 and 11. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, you're out of luck. But God will move someone to preeminence that may not be in the correct birth order. And when we see this title, firstborn for Jesus Christ, it is saying he is the preeminent heir. He has all the rights. He is the one who is lifted up. Some of you see the book, and I, or have seen the book. There is a book. Mostly the movie, which I will reference continually, which has been her. Because it gives this concept. You see, in Roman times, the firstborn or the heir may not even be related through DNA. You remember the story of Ben-Hur, Judah Ben-Hur. A Jewish man is put on the Roman slave ship. But through a, a large circum, amount of circumstances, he becomes the heir of Quintus Arius, this Roman nobility. And he says, you are my son. And by the act of that adoption, he is the firstborn. He has all the rights, and when he comes back, he has a high position and status because the rights of the firstborn have been conferred to him. Now, there's going to be a secondary way of looking at this, too. Jesus Christ is also the firstborn of all the new creation. Paul is using this in two terms, even in this passage. One, he is the firstborn eternally. He is God's only begotten son. He has this unique relationship in the Trinity of being the eternal son. Not created, eternal. He has all the rights, all the responsibility, all of the privileges, all the completeness of Godhood. But in the creation, when, he, when God becomes united with his creation in the person of Jesus Christ, and he has died and he rises from the dead. He is also the first of the new creation. So he is preeminent outside of creation from all eternity. He is also preeminent within creation as the man Jesus Christ.